Okay, so uh, last time we uh, ended the lecture by talking about a new way to do um, oops, a new way to do uh, uh, problems, which instead of talking about forces and accelerations and using kinematics, uh, we could instead use the fact that energy is uh, conserved. And so if we have no external forces acting on a system uh, doing work, then the energy of that system must be constant. And so in the case where we've got a, a, a ball being thrown up into the air, if we are ignoring air resistance, then the initial kinetic energy at the start of the trajectory must be equal to the final gravitational potential energy at the top of the trajectory where it's lost all of its kinetic energy. And so we can put our, our kinetic energy, a half mv squared, is equal to the final gravitational potential energy and come up with a calculation for the height as v squared over 2g, which if you remember back to when we were doing the kinematics, is exactly the formula we got from considering the vertical acceleration uh, uh, of the projectile, uh, which was uh, 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 minus g, and uh, solving things that way, right? So here, of course, we do have the mass of the object in, but the mass cancels out. It's irrelevant to this problem because both forms of energy, the kinetic and the gravitational potential energy, both of those are proportional to mass. So it doesn't matter what the mass of the object is. And so we end up with a result that's exactly the same as we got from our basic kinematics. So that's a new way to do problems. And since in energy, when you're using energy to do problems, all you care about is the initial condition and the final condition and the fact that no forces did work in between. So if you know that, then it becomes very easy to use energy to solve problems. And usually, if those conditions are met, then energy is probably the easiest way to solve a problem, right? rather than using kinematics. Because if you've got kinematics with forces that are varying all over the place, then you have to use calculus and integration or differentiation to figure things out. So always remember that there's an alternative to doing that, which is using energy. Uh, and in some cases, of course, you can't use energy necessarily because what's going on in between, you don't know whether it's adding or subtracting energy or how much it's adding or subtracting. And so then you need to use kinematics. Um, so the sort of the checklist is uh, you can't just blindly start using energy for everything. You need to go through a checklist. So the first thing is, do any external forces act on the system? If the answer to that is no, then you know the energy of the system is constant, and you can use that to solve the problem. If the answer is yes, there are external forces acting on the system, then the next question you have to ask is, do these do any work on the system? It's entirely possible to have a force that does no work if it's always perpendicular to the motion of the system. So for example, a normal force um, for an object that's you know, for the skier that we talked about, that normal force does no work. So it's almost as if there isn't an external force acting, right? There is an external force, but you can ignore it because it does no work. So again, you can use constant energy. But in the final case, if there is an external force acting and that external force is doing work, then you have to take account of the work done by that external force. And this is usually the case where you are less likely to want to use energy and you might be more likely to want to use kinematics, right? It's not a hard and fast rule, but if you get to this stage here and your force that's doing work is either unknown or varying, then you, you might want to start thinking about whether you should be using kinematics. So that's the sort of the, uh, the, the checklist that should be going through your mind before you use energy to solve a problem. So we've done energy now, but we've got to go one step further, and that's power. So we talked about doing work and how much work, we've, uh, uh, how much work we do. The next thing we have to talk about is how fast we can do work. Right? Um, that's a very useful quantity to have in physics. And so we define this new quantity called power, and we say that that is equal, the mean power of a system is equal to the work done by that system divided by the time that it takes the system to do it. Right? And so we've got work done here in joules, time taken SI units are seconds, so we've got joules per second, and that gets a new name, and it's called the watt, uh, with the abbreviation capital W, not lowercase w. But when you write the name, you always write it with lowercase. And it's named after uh, a British engineer from uh, Scotland 
who uh, uh, basically, um, he didn't so much invent the steam engine, uh, what he did was he put condenser valves uh, 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 around the piston to cause the steam to condense, and that massively improved the efficiency of the steam engine to the point where you could actually use it to do useful things. Um, and if you've ever heard of the term horsepower, you know, uh, you know lawn mowers, so many horsepower, uh, that was also his invention, uh, because as well as being an engineer, he was also a salesman and uh, had problems selling his steam engines because, of course, they were expensive, um, a lot more expensive than a horse. Uh, and so he, he labeled their power in terms of the power of one shire horse uh, so that he could say, well, okay, it's 10 horsepower, so it may be five times more expensive than a horse, but it does 10 times as, has 10 times the power. So uh, that was a, a sales pitch uh, entered our language. So... If we look at the power of a system, so this is for the mean power. What I'm going to do is I, I'm skipping forwards, and I'll, I'll talk about the uh, uh, instantaneous power. So if we've got an object here that's moving, so some point, uh, yeah, okay, good, it's coming up. So at some point later, it's at a different position, and we've got some force acting on that object, and we're going to take such a small period of time um, right, such a small period of time that the force doesn't have a chance to change, although it, it could be a varying force, but if we take a small enough period of time, uh, it, it doesn't have a chance to change. And during that period of time, we move the object through a displacement delta x, right? Then what we have is the work done, right, is it simply equal to the force vector dotted with the change in position, right? So if you remember, that's the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of the angle between them, right? So this is our, our definition for work done, and so we'll call that delta w, right? So during this infinitesimal period of time, the power of this force here is equal to the work done divided by the time it takes to do it, right? So that's work, and that's time taken. So that's our definition of power. So we've taken it for a small period of time, and... If we write that out and put this in, then the work done is simply the force dotted with the change in position divided by delta t. All right? And now what we want to do is we want to take the limit, because of course the force might vary slightly over this period, so we want to take the limit as delta t shrinks to zero. So... We've got that expression here, the force dotted with the change in position divided by the time taken to, to make that change. And of course, this, you already know, it's simply the velocity, the instantaneous velocity of the object. And so what we end up with is that the instantaneous power uh, is just the force vector dotted with the velocity vector. And that gives us the power of the force at any particular instant in time. And since both the force can change, and because the force is acting on the object, the velocity may also change, then these two quantities can vary in time. And so the instantaneous power of the force can actually change with time, right? It's not necessarily a, uh, a fixed quantity. Right, so our, uh, oops, this thing's come up. So our uh, 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 definition now for power, if I skip to the slide where we're doing this, is we end up with our 
force vector dotted with our velocity vector is equal to our power, or if we write that out in terms of the magnitude of the force, the magnitude of the velocity, in other words, the speed and this angle between them, then it's the force vector times the velocity times the cosine of the angle between them. And so each force that is acting on a moving object is going to have a power that's given by this. Right? So obviously, if the force vector is perpendicular to the velocity vector, then this angle here, cosine of 90, is 0. And so that force will have no power at all. And a force that's pulling in the same direction as the motion, um, where cosine here is, is equal to 1, will be just the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the velocity. But if you've got an angle in between them, then you have to either use this dot product or this angular relationship here, the force times the speed times the cosine of the angle between them. And since all of these quantities can change, you know, the magnitudes and the uh, uh, directions, the instantaneous, for the instantaneous power of a force can always be changing. Right? It doesn't necessarily remain constant all the time. Right? But it's got to be doing work in order for the power to be non-zero. So that's the, the other thing to remember. So now we've got a way to calculate the power of the force. So. A car's engine operates at a constant power, right? What happens to the accelerating force of the engine as the velocity of the car increases? And you can ignore uh, friction and air resistance, right? So all you're worrying about is the uh, uh, accelerating force of the car. There's no friction or air resistance. So if you're operating at a constant power, what happens to the accelerating force uh, uh, on the car? Oh, it's thinking. There we go. Ah, OK. We have, we have a winner. Well done. OK. Um, that is indeed the right answer. OK. Normally, when I ask this, uh, there's not as many people get the right answer. If I can get there. There we go. Excellent. So well done. That is the right answer. So, so what's going on here? Well, what's happening is we've got a constant power. So we've got our, our car. And here's our car modeled as a block. And we've got a, a force, accelerating force, acting on the car, uh, uh, causing it to move forwards with some acceleration. So what is going to happen here is if we look at the power of the force, it's F dotted with V. And since these are parallel, the velocity is going to be in the same direction as the force, then we can just put the, multiply the magnitudes together. We don't need to worry about the dot product because they're parallel, so we just multiply the magnitudes. So what's going to happen is the velocity here will increase, but the power here is constant. And so what that means is that the force here must decrease in order to keep this product being constant. And so therefore, it's a little bit counterintuitive because a lot of the problems you've done in the past, you have constant forces acting on objects that cause accelerations. Typically in real life, what actually is the limiting factor is not that you have a constant force, you have a maximum power rating. So a car can burn petrol at a maximum rate. It can't burn it faster than the, than the engine can consume it. And so that gives engines that we typically use a maximum power rating. And that maximum power rating is actually what limits the acceleration, not the, the force, force that, that the engine, engine can generate. generate right? Right? At, at low, low, at low, low rates, rates of turnover, turnover the, engine the engine can generate quite a large, large force. force. At, at higher rates, rates of turnover, turnover it, generates it generates a far, far smaller force simply, simply because, because it, can't, uh, uh, it, doesn't it doesn't have enough power uh, to, to generate a, a larger force. force. And so, so that's usually in real life the limiting factor for these things is power. And, and that's, that's why, why engines, engines do not generate, generate constant forces. forces. A, lot A lot of the problems we've been dealing with up to now have had constant forces uh, without regard to, to how, how we're producing those forces. forces. Um, um, but in real life, we have constant power simply because there's a, a maximum rate to us uh, burning the fuel that's powering the system. So, um, so you can work through this example. 
Uh, uh, I won't necessarily go through it in, in detail, but we've got power is force times velocity. So here we're told that we've got a, a car's engine with a 70 kilowatt power, and we've got a mass of uh, one and a half thousand uh, uh, kilograms. And then we're asked what the acceleration of the car is when it's traveling at 60 kilometers per hour or 100 kilometers uh, uh, per hour. And so we can calculate the force using our power here that's force times velocity. Um, we uh, we've got 70 kilowatts, so that's the power. We know the velocity, it's 60, and so we can get a, a force of 4,200 newtons. And then the second part, we just use Newton's second law to convert that force, given the mass, into an acceleration. And so we get 2.8 meters per second squared. And if you go and calculate it at 100 kilometers per hour, you end up with uh, 1.68 meters per second squared. And that's why, you know, if you're driving, it's quite easy to accelerate. You know, if you're at a, at a stoplight, you can ex easily accelerate off quite rapidly. Uh, whereas if you're uh, driving down the, the QE2 highway to Calgary um, and you pull out to overtake somebody going at, a, at 100 kilometers per hour, then it's a lot harder to accelerate uh, uh, there because the engine, your, your, your car's engine requires a lot more power in order to cause the same acceleration when it's traveling at high speed than it does when it's uh, uh, just setting off from rest. And so that's why your acceleration is good from rest and is, is not so good if you're traveling at, uh, at high velocity uh, uh, on the highway. Okay, any questions on that? Good. Okay, so, well, the, uh, I'll, I'll skip over this briefly because we're a little bit behind where we should be in the lectures. So what we're talking about here is, is why, why is power a limiting factor? Well, what we've got to remember is that when we're talking about a car engine doing work and accelerating something, we're converting our, our uh, 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 fuel that we feed into the car into kinetic energy for the, for the vehicle. And kinetic energy is a half mv squared. And it's this v squared term that's the reason for the increase in power that's required. Because if I double the speed of the car, I quadruple the kinetic energy. So what this is telling you, if you break this down as work done is the change in kinetic energy, then we can separate this as a half m times v squared, which is our final velocity, minus v naught squared, which is our initial velocity. And so we get something that's proportional to V minus V naught, as we would expect, but it's multiplied by V plus V naught here. So if we take this half V plus uh, uh, V naught, that is, uh, uh, oh, sorry, half V minus V naught, that is just the, no, half V plus V naught is the average velocity. So we can turn that into an average velocity, and V minus V naught is the change in velocity. And so what we get is that the work done needed uh, uh, the, the work we have to do to accelerate the car from, v, from a V naught to V is the mass times the average velocity uh, uh, multiplied by the change in velocity. So for the same change in speed, but at a higher average speed, we're going to need more, to do more work. And that's why we end up, the, the power uh, requirements on a force start to increase as you get to higher and higher uh, speeds. It's simply because the work done is, is not just dependent on the change in the uh, uh, velocity, it's also, or change in the speed, it's also dependent on the average speed. And that's simply because of this V squared term here rather than just a, a, a V term. And that's why we have to do more work the faster we get. Okay, so, This is just saying what I've said before. So the last bit of uh, energy uh, 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 that we have to deal with is converting energy. So almost all the questions we're dealing with were converting energy from one type of, uh, of energy to another type of energy. So, you know, steam engines, we talked about you're burning coal to turn it into heat energy, and then that heat energy, you're converting it into mechanical work energy, right? So it's a, it's a three-step 
uh, uh, process. Uh, nuclear power, um, you start with uh, uh, an unstable atom that you cause to fission by adding a neutron that releases, uh, essentially converts the binding energy uh, uh, of the nucleus uh, into heat energy. The heat energy you use to uh, heat some uh, uh, coolant, which you then turn into steam and use it to uh, uh, produce mechanical energy. And then that mechanical energy you use to turn uh, a, a, a coil in a magnetic field and convert it finally into electrical energy. And every time you do a conversion process, the law of thermodynamics tells us that we will never convert all of the energy from one form into another. There is always going to be a loss. You cannot have 100% efficiency of conversion from energy from one form into another, uh, but that you deal with more in sort of the, the 300 level thermodynamics course. Um, for now, all you need to know is that any time you convert energy from one form into another in a non-ideal system, in a real-world system, you are going to end up losing some of that energy. So you won't get 100% conversion efficiency. So you've got to take account of that when you're converting things. So let's do a steam engine because that's got a nice, simple uh, 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 three-fold conversion. So if we take the, uh, uh, the Mallard, which is the uh, fastest steam engine in the world and has been for a long time because nobody builds steam engines anymore, um, it achieved a speed of uh, just over 200 kilometers per hour uh, in 1938 over a five-kilometer stretch of track. Um, and in fact, even the modern trains now running on the same bit of track only go about 10% faster. Um, so what we're given is that we've got coal containing 30 megajoules of heat energy, of course, chemical energy. We've got 30 megajoules of chemical energy per kilogram. When we burn it and extract the heat from that burning process, um, when we burn it, we get 80% of the chemical energy is converted into heat energy. And then we extract of that heat energy, we extract about half of that heat energy uh, uh, to give mechanical energy. Right? So we've got two efficiencies here. And we have a, a frictional force of 10 kilonewtons from the coaches that are dragging the engine uh, uh, back. So we've got to overcome that frictional force uh, in order to move forwards. So the first thing we've got to do is calculate the power of the engine. In other words, what rate of energy do we have to be producing in order to keep the train moving at a constant velocity, right? Because what we've got now is we've got our train here. It's got a sloped front. Um, and we've got our, our coaches here. And these are pulling back with the frictional force here of 10 kilonewtons. So if we have no acceleration, right, we want to be traveling at a constant velocity over this, uh, over this period of the track in order to get the speed record, then the force that the engine must be generating here from, from burning uh, its fuel must be also 10 kilonewtons. So that the net force on the engine is equal to zero, and there's neither an acceleration nor a deceleration. Right? So we're going to have a, a balancing force. So what this tells us is that the force that the engine is generating has to be 10 kilonewtons because it's overcoming the friction due to the uh, uh, carriages. So the power is now going to be 10,000 newtons, that's the force, multiplied by the velocity, which is, uh, what do you say, 202 kilometers per hour. And then we've got to convert that into meters per second. So multiply by 1,000 to convert kilometers into meters and divide by 3,600 to convert hours um, into, uh, um, uh, into seconds. So this is the, the, the power that we've got. So here's the force. And this is V in meters per second. And What this gives us is that the power uh, we need to generate in the engine is 561,000 watts, so 561 kilowatts, 
right? So that's the engine power that we've got to produce in order to keep the train moving at a constant speed, right? If we don't produce that, we're going to be decelerating because friction will, will overcome us. So once we've got the power, then all we have to do now is calculate how long do we have to uh, sustain the power. So the time taken is just going to be the uh, distance divided by the uh, uh, velocity, right? So this is, the distance is five kilometers. We divide that by 202 kilometers per hour, and that gives us the time in, uh, um, in hours that we need to uh, uh, run the uh, train for, and then we multiply that by 3,600 to give us the time in seconds. So that gives us uh, delta T in seconds, and then the work done is simply going to be the power times the time. Now, here, because we've got a constant power, we can just use multiplication. If the power is varying, you would have to integrate it over time, right? So if you had the power as a function of time, then you would actually have to use integration to find it out. Here, it's simple because this is constant, so uh, no, ca no integration. Right? And we'll, t we'll talk a little bit more about varying forces and things in, in a minute. So the work done is just the power times the time. We've calculated the power, that's 361, uh, 561 uh, times 10 to the 3 watts, um, multiplied by our, our 5 over 202 oops, uh, times 3,600, and that gets uh, 50 megajoules. So the amount of energy we have to produce is 50 megajoules, right? But that's the end result. That's the end mechanical energy. Now, we're told that we're 50% efficient at converting heat energy into mechanical energy. So 50% of heat goes to mechanical. So what this means is that the heat energy required will be 50 uh, uh, megajoules divided by 50%, right, or 100 megajoules. So we have to have 100 megajoules of heat energy in order to provide 50 megajoules of mechanical energy, right? So now we know how much heat energy we need to produce, but we also have an 80% conversion of chemical to heat, so what this means is that the amount of chemical energy we need will be 100 megajoules divided by 80%, right? Because we only get 80% of whatever we started with for chemical energy uh, and convert it into heat energy. And so if we do that, we end up with 125 megajoules of energy. as being required, right? So we have to have 125 megajoules of chemical energy in coal in order to provide the uh, uh, um, mechanical energy to keep the speed up over this five kilometers. And then all we have to do is we take this 125 uh, uh, megajoules, divide it by the number of megajoules per kilogram of coal, and we end up with the total uh, mass of coal that we have to burn in order to keep the train at a constant velocity over this five kilometer stretch of track, right? So all we've done here is we, we've used a little bit of kinematics, we've used our, our relationship between um, work and power, and we've uh, um, used our conversion efficiencies, right? So that's the type of problem that you may come up with uh, uh, in the exam uh, where you're doing conversions uh, uh, as efficiencies and you have to relate all this sort of work and energy uh, uh, together. And if you happen to be in Britain, in northern England, you can go to the Railway Museum in York and you can actually see the mallard. And I think actually I've, I've greatly overestimated the uh, conversion efficiencies in some cases. I think it's more like about 20% of the uh, heat energy gets converted into useful mechanical energy. Um, but anyway, that's for, for this question, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're just numbers.
Okay, any questions on that? Good. Okay, so now the more challenging part uh, uh, of work and energy. So, so far what we've been dealing with really are, are relative, you know, constant forces moving over nice sort of straight line distances and we haven't had too much uh, uh, variation. And as you can imagine, once we start things varying, we have forces that can change in magnitude, change in direction and so on. Um, we are gonna end up with having to do calculus. So the way we can do this is we can draw a plot of the force versus the displacement, right? So and if we draw, if a, we plot, draw a plot, Of force, of force versus, versus displacement. displacement. Now, now, what I'm going to make a slight make change, change here is it's not just the total force, force, it's the force, it's the force parallel, parallel to the displacement, right? In, right? in case we have multi-dimensional problems. Problem. But, but if we're considering, if we're considering just a one-dimensional one problem, 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 then this, then would, this be would be x, x and then this, and of course, would be the force, and the force is constrained to act in the one dimension, So when we say here it's the force that's parallel to the displacement, certainly at the level of this course, we're only going to with um, when we come when to problems problem like this, we're only really going to be dealing with one-dimensional one dimensional problems. problems. But, but in general, in general you, do have you do have to remember that it's the that component, the component of, the of the force is parallel, parallel to this, to this displacement, displacement here, here. Not, 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 not just the entire, the entire force, force if, 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 if it's multidimensional. multidimensional. So if we so have, if we have some, some uh, um, force that varies, say like that, right? We've got a force that's varying with position. The question is now, well, what is the work done by that force? Well, what we can do is we can, is we take, can this take this plot, plot and we can, and we divide, can divide it up, it up into, into rectangles, rectangles like this, like this that, that sit underneath, underneath the, the line. line. Right. Right. And each, and one, each of one of these is a delta, is a delta x, x here. here. And, and we have, we the, have force the force here, here varying, varying over time. Over time. So, so if, we, if assume we assume that for that this, this period of time, period of time here, the force, here, the force is roughly, is roughly constant, constant, right? right? Take and we can we see where this is going to go, go. Right? Then, right? The, work then the work done, done here, here in, in this, little, this period, little period, delta, delta w, w, this is simply, simply the force, because, because we're saying this is now the component of the force that's parallel to the displacement. So it's just whatever that value of the force is, so it's F1 in this case, multiplied by delta x because it's constant, it's constant over, that, over period. that period. And then, of and course, then of what course we do, do is we sum over, over all the delta, delta W's to find, to find the total work. work. It's the sum it's of the all sum the little contributions. contributions. And we and sum we over Fi times delta, delta X. X. And so we and sum up the areas of all of these rectangles. And of course, we get the answer wrong because the force is not constant over this displacement delta X. So what we have to do is we take the limit as, as delta, delta x, x goes, goes to zero, to zero and, and of this, of this sum, sum over i of, I of fi delta, delta x, x and, and what that gives, what that us, gives of us of course is the, is integral, the integral of the force, the force and dotted, dotted, with, dotted with, delta with delta x. x. So, this so this is where I'm going to actually write in. This is, this my, is my way of way saying the component of the force is parallel to the displacement. I could write f cos theta, but I might as well just write the dot product here. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, and this sorry, isn't this delta, delta, this is D. Right. And so, and so if, we if we integrate the force, the force with, respect with respect to the displacement, the displacement or with respect to the position, the position then, then we will end up with the work, with the work done, done, and that's, and that's how, how we can, we can deal, deal with, with a force, a force that, that varies, varies with position. With position. So, when we're doing these plots here, uh, graphically, of course, when we're integrating over a region of a line, what we're getting is that the work done is this area under the curve. So if you've got a straight line here, you can also calculate the work done by just calculating the area under the curve. Obviously, well, if it's not a curve, then it's a straight line. Um, but if you've got a curve here, you have to integrate. So you can either integrate or you can just use uh, uh, triangles if it happens to be a straight line, and you can calculate the work done as the area under the line uh, here. Now, of course, if this line is down here, then you end up with negative work. So, what about a typical uh, uh, force that varies? Well, the simplest variable force 
Um, and the one that we're going to deal with is Hooke's Law. So what Hooke's Law says is that if you have a spring, uh, there we go. So if we have a spring here, and I extend it, then the extension of the spring, right, so the amount by which I extend it, is proportional to the force that I am applying to extend it. So what we're going to try here is, so I have a spring now, and it is, well, I don't know whether you can see it. You, probably, you, know, you can't read the scale here. Um, but if I hold it level with the top, then it's hanging about 17 centimeters. So it's, it's reading 17 centimeters here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook one weight onto it. And I don't want to do vibrations. That's next term. It's now reading 31. So I've got 17 minus 31, uh, which is 14 centimeters of extension. So if Hooke's law holds, I add another equal mass, another equal weight to it. Well, actually, I better be careful here. I'm holding it here. So 30 centimeters, sorry. So that's an extension of, uh, what did I say before, 14? So that's 16 centimeters extension. Right, now I add another weight here, and we'd expect to get another 16 centimeters extension from the, the force, and so that would go to 46. And it goes to 49. OK, so there's some experimental error going on in here. Let's just make sure I've got the. I think part of the problem is that I'm trying to hold it. It's difficult to actually hold it level. OK, let's try that. So it's 16 centimeters there. With one mass, it's 29 now. OK, so that makes a difference. So it's 29. Uh, so that's uh, uh, 13 centimeters extension. So 29 plus 13, that would be uh, 49.52. And it's 51. OK. So not perfect, right? But, but, but not too bad, right? So we've got a spring. Uh, the problem is, of course, is that these springs are not, they're never actually perfect. Uh, uh, if you get a good spring, this one actually, the coils seem to vary in, in width. Uh, if you get a good spring, then the agreement is pretty good over a, a reasonable range uh, of extensions. But at the very start of providing an extension, and at the very end of the extension, um, you know, when it's reaching its elastic limit, then you get deviations from, from Hooke's law. And so I'm guessing here is that this one's got a slight deviation because we're starting it from scratch. And then the thing, of course, you'll be end up doing... Um, Next term is uh, oscillations like that, which you can also, uh, uh, the, the frequency of these oscillations is determined by the mass and by uh, Hooke's law. So you'll see that this oscillates more rapidly with a lower mass. Okay. But I hope you can at least, there's a reasonable degree of proportionality between the two. All right, and this, constant of proportionality varies for each spring. Each spring, in theory, can have a different constant of proportionality, and it's called the spring constant. Uh, in fact, next term, what you'll find is that uh, by looking at the material and bulk properties of the material, you can actually calculate the spring constant for a, uh, a particular spring, or at least, uh, um, well, maybe not spring, but so much as... Um, the uh, elastic material, you can actually calculate spring constants for elastic material. So, what we've got here is we've got a force versus displacement plot that is a nice straight line, right? When we have zero displacement, then we have zero force. And when we have a finite displacement, we've got a, a linearly increasing force. force. So, so we, we end, end up, up with, with a... a This, this is, is force, force, and this, and this is, is displacement, displacement, and then, and then of, course, of course, this, this is simply, simply f, f equals, equals kx, kx from Hooke's law. law. So, so if we if want to, we can just take the area under this plot, plot to, calculate to calculate the work, the work done. done. So, so work done going out to an extension x, and we go from zero, 
And if we look at this, we can say, well, at this point here, it's going to be a half times the perpendicular, uh, times the base, which is x, times the perpendicular height, which is kx. Right? So this is the base and perpendicular height. Right, this, right, this is just, just the area of a triangle. Of a triangle. And, and so that, so that gives, gives us a half kx, kx squared. squared. And so and that so one's that nice and easy. We can, we can, we can just, just do it by, by uh, area, area of a triangle. triangle. If we if want to do it uh, uh, more, more generically, generically and as you use integration, integration then, then what we'll end, end up with is the work done is the integral of kx dx. And, and so, so if, if we, we integrate, integrate this, we increase, increase the power by one, once, so we get kx, kx squared, squared, and, and we, we divide by the new power, power so, we so we divide by, by two. two. And then and we then get, get added, added onto on that, that a constant. constant. So, so this, this is, is the thing I think a lot of you seem to have problems with, is getting, getting rid of these constants of integration. So if we haven't extended the spring, we've done no work. Right? The spring's just sitting there, there's no extension to the spring, so we've done no work. So, so when, when x, x is zero, zero the, the work that we've, that we've done, done is also zero, zero because we've just started it at, at, at zero, zero extension and left it there, there. we've done anything to the system. system. So, so x, x is zero implies work, work is zero. zero. And so and then, then we take these two, these two points, points and we put, put them into this equation. equation. So, so that w here is zero is equal to a half times k times zero squared plus our constant. And so, and so therefore, therefore we, we get that this constant of integration itself has, has to be zero. zero. And, and so, so we end up with the work done is equal, equal to a half k x squared. And, and that is the end work, work that we've done stretching a spring. spring. And that, and that of, course, of course is then stored in the coils of the now stretched spring. spring. And, and so, so we, we call, call that the elastic potential energy. energy. In, In other words, words it's the potential for the spring to do work. work. That, that stretch spring, spring now can actually do, do work on a system, and it can do up to this amount of work as it reduces its extension, extension to zero. zero. And, and so, so this is the work done, but it's also the elastic potential energy. And, and that, that is another, another form of uh, mechanical energy that you're going to have to deal with in problems. You know, if you've got a stretch string now, then you can have energy stored in that, uh, uh, in that stretched spring or stretched piece of elastic rubber, whatever, right? So it's a new way to, to store energy, and uh, you've got to take account of that uh, in problems. So, the typical type of problem is things like bungee jumpers. So let's do an interpretation. Which of these plots represents a force which does a net negative amount of work? Ah, OK, so we see now a bit of disagreement here. Uh, so A, B seems to be the favorite, but A, A and D have got uh, uh, equal support. So uh, turn to your neighbor and uh, convince them that you've got the right answer. Bingo, wow, okay, everybody changed their mind. So uh, that is indeed the right answer, right? B is the, okay, if I can just select it, B is the, uh, is the right answer. So the reason, the reason B is the right answer, though, I did, I did hear a couple, of, uh, a couple of people suggesting slightly wrong reasons as to why B is the right answer. So B is the right answer because uh, as you go from here to here, you've got a positive change in position, and you have a negative force, so you're moving in the opposite direction to the force, so your object, or whatever it is that's moving, is doing work against the force, which is negative work. But if the position itself had also been negative, it would have made no difference, right? So if this origin, instead of being, instead of being here, had been here, so you'd had negative position, 
you would have still had negative work because what matters for the uh, uh, work done is it's the change in position, right? So you'd still be moving from here to here, which is a positive change in position. It's not the absolute sign of the position that matters. It's the fact that you're moving in a positive direction that matters, right? So the fact that you're going from negative to positive means that you're, you're, you've got a positive change in displacement, and that means uh, that if you've got a negative force, you've done negative work, right? So don't get confused by the uh, uh, sign of the displacement, uh, uh, the position coordinate. It's the change in displacement that matters. Okay, so I'll, uh, we'll finish off work on uh, Friday and start on impulse and momentum.